I mean, glad to be at the Gate Church on a Sunday. Amen. All right. Are we doing okay, Oklahomans? I was like, no. Are you guys are you over here? On, little wink on the front row from the Bama fans. They're doing okay. Are we going to make it today? Is God still on the throne today? <laughs> Amen. I just sense that God is doing something specific today on this last Sunday in the year. Do you sense that? There is, there's just a presence here today. Listen, I don't know what it is that you're facing. I just hear God saying that whatever you're believing for, you keep believing because the day is a day of breakthrough for you. There's just a presence here. So I just feel like some people are giving up on their dream, but God's going to wake up the I'm not giving up on the inside of you this morning. Amen. Would you stand with me? I want to pray into that just a minute. I'll, you can grab your Bible if you will, and, and John think can help me. I want to share some prayer time, but I... I want, to, I want us to believe together. Would you just pray with me? Just lift your voice right now and just let's trust God. Father, we thank you today. There is an atmosphere of faith that stirred in this house this morning. Lord, on this final day in December, Lord, there are dreams and visions arising. There is hope, Lord, coming back to life. Lord, we speak life over our dreams. We speak life over our future. I just want you to get a confession in your mouth today that God is is bringing back to life things that seem like they were gone from you. Come on, it is still 2018. There, it, there's not a whole lot of difference except that this is a moment we stand in faith for believing for the future, but knowing that God's not done yet. God, we believe in faith for what, that which you are not done with. Lord, we get in faith for those things that we're still believing for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I pray for your people today, God. Many of them have walked through a difficult season, but I pray, God, faith will rise on the inside of them this morning. This would not be a time that we end in discouragement, but hope would arise right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Can you shout amen? amen. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 6 with me this morning. I'm going to preach and share. We had an amazing time in the first service talking about this prophetic witness from Isaiah. As you turn there, I want to remind you that something mentioned on the screen. Uh, first of all, uh, Bishop and Pastor Kathy send their greetings today. Uh, they're having some much needed time off with family, and so we bless them. We're thankful for them and uh, the vision that God's put in their heart. But we're believing that in January, we're going to take it to a whole nother level. You might know what that's, I'm talking about, a whole nother. You don't say another, right? Just a whole, everybody say a whole nother level. You got to say it just like that. We're taking it to a whole nother level in January. We're going to have January 9th, a time of prayer for our men and women. How many of you realize that when the men and women of God get together to pray, amazing things happen? Well, we will see breakthrough when we begin to pray together. So I want you to mark on your calendar on January 9th and get ready. We need to fill this church up. Uh, I think we're going to meet in even two, two uh, parts of the church. The men are going to pray together. The ladies are going to pray together. We may come together. More details coming about that. But we're going to pray on January 9th. Because, listen, we're believing for breakthrough and multiplication next year. Come on, there is something moving on the gate church. I don't know if you know it or have sensed it. But there is something happening here at this church that is new. And God is moving us into that season. So I want you to do that. And then if you've never been... To, how many of you have ever been to a Monday night at the gate? Let me see your hand. You've been to a Monday night. There are miracles that happen on that night like none other. I don't know what it is about it. But there is some incredible breakthrough on our Monday nights. And that's happening on January 9th, January 14th. And I want you to get ready for that. Bishop is going to be preaching. We're going to have a, an amazing breakthrough. We're going to be praying for incredible, miraculous touch of God. Healings. We've seen healing manifestations on that night. We've had people come back with, with cancer being healed, with, with doctor's reports coming back. Just an incredible financial breakthroughs. But that will happen on, on January 14th. So get in faith with me and believe God for that. Are you ready for God's Word? Look at Isaiah chapter 6 and let me share this with you this morning. Isaiah 6, Isaiah is a prophetic witness to the messianic hope. All, all throughout Isaiah, and there's actually divided up in three parts, three sections, but all throughout you get this hope that with God, even in the time of exile and discouragement and, and fear, and it seems like everything is, is going the wrong way, even in that time, the, the, the Lord, the power of God still reigns. That's, that's Isaiah's message, that there is a coming Lord, and He rules above all other lords. 
there is a God that is the God of all other gods. And, as, and Isaiah steps into those moments and he begins to prophesy. And that's what he's doing in Isaiah 6. And he says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated, seating upon the throne, high and lifted up. Say, high and lifted up. He was exalted on the throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. He's making a declaration that God, his authority, fills the whole world. How many of you realize that what Genesis tells us is that God's temple or his throne is all the world. So when God sits on his throne, he's sitting on the throne of the world. Listen, he's in your life and in my life, but he's ruling on all the world. That's his throne. And he says, above him stood the seraphim. And he had six wings with two that he covered with his face and two he covered with his feet. And with two he flew. And when one called to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And here it is. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah's getting a picture, a vision of something he doesn't quite understand. I don't know about you, but sometimes when God tells me something, it seems odd to me. Listen, if you're not getting a little nervous and scared and un- un- and released, you don't understand what it is God's saying, you're not doing it right. you got to get a little bit of like, what am I looking at? Two wings covering their eyes, two wings of... Their, their feet and two wings are flying. He's saying it was odd to me, but I just heard this one thing in the midst of it all. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord and the whole earth is full of his glory. Then he says this, the foundations, as I saw what God was showing to me, the foundations of the, of, and the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. Isaiah got in the middle of this vision about what God was doing and what God was saying. And the house was filled with the presence of the Lord, but he didn't have a sense of lightheartedness. He had a deep sense of, woe is me, I'm, I am in a mystery. I'm in the middle of something that's bigger than me, and I'm lost. See, I, don't, I have this, been praying about this this week that I feel like that many of you are in a season in 2018 where you felt like everything around me seems to be lost and I seem disoriented and confused. But I want to say to somebody today, right in the midst of that, there's something around you crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of His glory. See, the enemy wants to say to you, I'm taking you down. I'm putting you in an isolated place. I'm going to make you discouraged. I'm going to put you away where nobody can get to you. But i got to tell you, God has hidden you in a place of secret, in a place that seems dark and isolated, but the Lord is with you, and He surrounded you, and He's singing over you, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, God Almighty. I want to tell you today that right in the middle of your dark place, a new season is beginning. Come on, I came with a word today for somebody. Right in the middle of your dark place, a new season is beginning. Can you get in faith with me? Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we receive it with thanksgiving. We know, God, what you're doing right here on the final Sunday in December is not insignificant. But it is specific to where you're taking us. So we get ready right now to receive your word. And listen, Lord, we want to act on that word. We want to not just preach that word, but we want to act on that word. And we receive it in the name of Jesus. Can you shout amen? Amen. Amen. High five a few people. Say, get ready. A new season's beginning. Isaiah is ending one season. King Uzziah has died. King Uzziah was ending in a failed kingship. He, he, he violated the sacred order of God. And I, and I imagine that he might be like many of us. When, when things happen in our life that disappoint us, we get thrust into a place where we, we're confused. We don't know what is, what, it, what is it that you're doing. How many of you ever asked God, Lord, what is it that you're doing? Have you ever asked God, do you know what you're doing? 
Am I the only one that ever asked the Lord, do you really know what you're doing? Because you're supposed to go this. How many of you ever tried to coach God along? You, Lord, if you'll just do this and work this out. But, and we get this great vision of how glorious he is. And what we want to do is we want to help him get there. Is it just, am I the only one here? I, I want to help the Lord along. And then I, instead of it turning out the way I want it to, I get thrust into a place that seems dark. But what I've come to realize is that whatever has tested me in this season is prepping me for the next season. Whatever has caused me to be confused or caused me to be disoriented is actually preparing me and disorienting me in a way that I'm losing some things that I don't have need of anymore so that I can step into that place that God's called me to be and be the man that God's making me into. James chapter 1 verse 2 and 4, shown on the screen, James says it this way as he He's been processed. See, you got to remember, James has been through one of these seasons. See, he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He, 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 he and other, the other disciples trusted that God was going to do something one way, and God didn't do it that way. You know, we, he, he thought, well, Jesus is coming preaching the new kingdom, so the kingdom must be coming as a takeover of the present empire. And God was, Jesus was trying to say to them, yes, there's a takeover, but it's beyond this world. It's otherworldly. I'm actually bringing my kingdom in, not through violence and force, but through death and resurrection. And James says to, to his disciples, to those people, that, to the church, he says, count it all joy, brothers. When you meet trial of various kinds. Does that challenge anybody else but me? Have you ever taken joy in your trial? Is it difficult for you, like it is for me, to take joy when I'm tested and I'm in a dark place? Maybe 2018 has been a, a season like that for you. Maybe you've been at a place where you feel like, what this seems disorienting and God, where are you? And in the midst of that, James says, count it joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and faithfulness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. The, passage we, the, the message we get from Scripture is that as God takes us through the process of salvation, as He moves us from one step to the next, it seems disoriented, but it's all about the perfecting of my faith. It's all about making me whole and complete. It might not be about me getting what I want. Can I get an amen? See, I believe that God is preparing the gate church for this next season of multiplication. That's why our times of prayer and our times of partnership and believing God together are critical. That's why it's important for you to be here on January 14th. See, we have to come together as a church body and stop treating church like it's some consumer event where we just have a good time and enjoy what we have and then we get to leave with our blessing. We need to come together as a church where we believe for breakthrough beyond just what I want and what I can get and what will be good for me. We have to move into a place as a church where we come together on prayer times and fasting times and breakthrough and miracle times, not for what I want, so that the glory of the Lord could be known and people would all hear the Lord say, Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This season that we're in, as we begin to pray and think about the uniqueness of, of this, this part of December, the last Sunday in December, we start off, we, we move through December in the Advent season, and we begin to talk about all the events that are happening on the church calendar. Traditionally, church calendar, we've been talking about all the things that happened in the beginning of the Gospels when, when um, we, have, we have the event with Mary and, and, and Joseph, and then Mary conceives a child. And, and then we have this pronouncement of the coming Messiah to the shepherds, and this great celebration of the angels, and the angels gather around and they begin to declare that, that, that the Lord has made way. Salvation is coming. What's interesting about the end of December is it sits right between the pronouncement or the announcement of the miracle and what we often celebrate in the 1st of January is what's called Epiphany Sunday. It's revelation, the revelation of the Christ. 
Right here in the middle, though, we have this mourning season because outside of the pronouncement, when the announcement was made, Herod, the empire, reacted violently. And he, what, he, what he reacted by was how all power in, in on earth reacts by acting out by trying to kill and destroy anything that threatened his power. And so he kills all the children two years and under in Bethlehem in, in that surrounding region where he was at and, and it, it really fulfilling a prophecy in Old Testament history that what God was doing in that time would require that at some point in time the enemy is going to react in violence and death. And so we find ourselves right in the middle of pronouncement and revelation. And we put ourselves right in the middle of this dark season and we wonder, is God still here? See, you and I might, you may be like me. At times I found myself between the time I came down to the altar and got a prophetic word and God spoke to me or, or I had God speak to me in a, in a, in a great a revelation and a, an announcement in my life that God's going to provide a promise, but I'm not quite over here to fulfillment and revelation. I'm stuck somewhere in the middle and I'm wondering, God, where are you? It's, we wonder, how, is, how are you going to use Herod's destructive, violent behavior to bring about the promise that you said to the shepherds? Lord, we thought you said. Lord, we, how many of you have said that? Lord, we thought you said. And when God's way and His plan doesn't line up with my expectation, you meet disappointment. When God's way and His plan don't match up with my expectation, we meet disappointment. And many of us in 2018 have found ourselves in disappointment, but really what we're in is we're in that dark transition season. But I can tell you this, as sure as the pronouncement was made, the revelation will come. As sure as the pronouncement that God has come to earth, I can tell you that no Herod, no empire, no devil in hell can stop that from happening. You can't keep him out. You can't drive him out. You can't push him away. When God makes a promise, he's going to come through. That's, that's the place that we find ourselves today. And I wonder in your 2018, do you feel like sometimes that I'm in that middle of that season. And I've come to tell you this morning, you might be in that dark season, but revelation and manifestation and fulfillment is on the way. It's a reminder that there's a process to salvation. Salvation starts in a promise, but it moves into the testing of your faith before it ends in that manifestation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says that in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was what? It was void. It was formless. Tohu abohu. It had nothing. It seemed like to everyone else that there was nothing there. But then he says the Spirit of God was hovering over the deep. In the middle of that nothingness, God was hovering. Can I suggest today that your nothingness just might be a lot of something in the Spirit of God's hovering over it? There might be something that you say, it might just be that the nothing you think is happening is actually something really big because the Spirit is breathing. I don't know where you're at today, but in, in, in that moment of creation, the Holy Spirit hovering and breathing life. See, what you, may be, what you may experience as nothing happening might be God breathing new life, breath by breath, into that dream, into that promise. And Isaiah, he saw the glory of the Lord. He saw that revelation coming. And then suddenly, as he saw that, the darkness filled the room and everything around him being, began to shake. And I want to ask you this question. Have you ever obeyed God only to have the very door you're walking through begin to shake around the threshold? Have you ever said yes to God only to find out the floor you're walking into begins to shake around you? It's a good sign that you're following the lead of God because only when faith is awakened do you get an adversary that wants to kill what God's about to do. If you're in this room today and you have seen the attack of the enemy, know this, your faith has awakened the promise and somebody's recognizing what God can and will do through you. 
I believe that God's word for you today is get ready because some of you are coming out and through a dark season and into a season of fulfillment. I wonder if there's somebody that will receive that word today. You're walking into a season of fulfillment. The principle is that taking a step of faith into God's promise will always feel shaky, uncertain, unsure, and unknown. Taking a step of faith will feel uncertain, unsure, unknown. You'll feel like the world around you is shaking. And we get to a place sometimes as believers where we want everything in life to be a celebration moment. How many of you have ever seen that? We, we, all, we want it to be high and exciting and fulfilling and we want to be celebrating. We see people giving testimony. You know what you don't see? You don't see the months they spent on their knees crying. You don't see the price they had to pay where they were saying, Lord, I'm in a dark place and I can't find my way out. All you see is the testimony. Well, let me tell you social media advocates that God is bigger than just some post on a social media account. There's more to the story. He's the God in the darkness just as much as the God in the light. And I want to know, when I know the God of darkness, I can celebrate the God of life. I won't be relegated to just a cotton candy, Lord, help me, bless me, have a good time. I'm going to celebrate. Give me what I want. I've had enough of it. I don't want consumer Christianity. I don't want my children to always be wanting for something and needing something. I want to live for a God that is more than enough even when I've got nothing. I want to live for a God that says, I've provided for you. You have everything you need. Don't get caught up in the empire of this world. I won't be relegated to a Satan that keeps me wanting and wanting an empire, a culture that keeps me desiring more and never being fulfilled. It's an empty, it's an empty uh, uh, well. There's, there's never enough to fill it. And I've tried to, one of the things that you may be like me, we, we, you know, you don't, with children, we were all this way, but we, and some of us we, as adults were this way. It's like it's never enough. And what I've noticed is, I, I've noticed, now all the kids that are in the room are not going to like this, but the more I actually give my children, the more they won't. Isn't that really, isn't that something? I, you, you know, kids might have a Christmas list and they make a list. You fulfill that list, they'll make the list bigger. And I, and I was thinking, I thought this yesterday. You know, it, 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 means are relative. You might have, you could have enough to, to do a, a small wooden toy or, or buy all of Best Buy. It's all relative. It, when you keep giving, it's never enough when your fulfillment is in the having. Instead of in the process of making you into who God wants you to be. And so yesterday, even my daughter, she, we, she got, I don't, I don't know if this is one thing I'm kind of getting... I don't know if I love Christmas cash because you get these gifts and then you have cash to get more things. And it's like, and, I, and I, we asked her, said, well, honey, what do, you want to, what do you want to get? And I look on her face and I realize that she has everything she could really want and more. But there's this spirit that tries to get on us to try to make us believe that we don't have enough. And so we keep wanting for more and we keep trying to take money or power or means to fill a gap that only God can fill. The problem is he's trying to fill it in a dark place. He's trying to fill it while you're on your knees before him, crying out to him, Lord, fill my life with what substance matters, change my heart. Form me and make me the man you called me to be. There's no means. There's no power. There's not amount of toys. There's not enough technology to get you where God wants you to be. It's only in the place of suffering sometimes that you find out that God I serve is enough. So I want to tell you today, if you've been suffering, you've been in a good place. Because it's only in that place that you can find out that God is the God of more than enough. Your faith is often awakening that suffering. Your faith is often often awakening that trial. you got to realize that the Magi, were their faith in what they saw, at least, in the stars, their faith activated the dark actions of Herod. 
If it wasn't for the Magi responding in faith, Herod wouldn't have responded the way he was. I want to know today, have you ever responded with a step of faith and you felt attacked afterwards? What we need to notice, even all throughout the biblical narrative, is this is the process of God. He awakens faith in Israel, in Moses. He takes them to the Red Sea, and he puts a big body of water between them and their death, their impending death. It's only when your faith is, is alive that you find yourself in a need for a miracle. We have, to, we have to follow this, this process that God takes us when we activate our faith. So I said in the first service, sometimes I feel like following God is like poking a bear. I, I, that's how it feels sometimes. I feel like God says, go poke that bear. I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't, I mean, see, here's the thing. When you first get saved, you'll poke anything, any bear. Any, any beast, you just, because you just think, you just have all kinds of faith. The problem is, after the first time, God, he, he gives you a gimme. The bear runs. But about the third time, he turns around and whacks you in the face. And then you start to question your, your new faith process. You start to wonder, is this really a good idea? See, here's the thing. Your experiences are often a detriment to your faith because your faith and hope is lying in what you experience instead of in the God of the Word. Some of us have struggled not to just have our focus on what happened in our life and instead turn our focus and our ears, come on, our ears. Sometimes we need to turn off our eyes and listen first so that we can see what He is saying. I want to know, can you see what he is saying? I know you can see your test. I know you can see what's against you. I know you can name all the people who hate you and all the people who are against you and how they're all devils. The problem is they're so focused on devils, they're going in the wrong direction. God's moving in the other direction. If we had our eyes on him, we are moving toward the promise. So we can't get caught between the season of pronouncement and fulfillment by just chasing all the devils and all the Herods and trying to stop them. We have to realize no matter what comes against me, God is able to bring about what he promised. I remember a time, some time back, and this is real, a real intimate story for Jennifer and I, that as we were believing God for our family, and I've shared this with some of you, but we, we trusted God, but we had had miscarriages, and, and some of you have had this experience of, of struggling to start a family, but we knew God had a word for us. We had, this wasn't just a wanton desire. We knew God had given us a word. This is what we were supposed to do. This is what God's promise was. And so some of you may be familiar with the in vitro process, and so we began to do that. And I said in the first service, and this is true, as you're in your late 20s and, and early 30s, sometimes you don't have enough money for groceries, much less for a major medical exp uh, expense. Right? Blue Cross Blue Shield wasn't interested in me having kids at that moment. So, <laughs> praise God. It was all on me. But I realized it's actually all on God. Because whatever he promises, he provides for. And so we took a step of faith. And as, as we went through that process, you know, it's just a miracle. God, we had a great team of, of, of medical professionals around us. And we, we conceived. And so God provided. And, and the celebration, how many of you, whenever you thought, that, this is it. You did, it's like I did this, I did this, and I, and I did that, and I prayed the right prayer, and then, and then God provided. And you start celebrating, you start getting excited. Well, for Jennifer and I, the dream died. Seven weeks later, we're holding each other in, in the doctor's office, and we've lost our promise. And it was devastating for us. We were discouraged. And I realized at that moment, I started asking myself this question, well, did I pray right? Have you ever said that before? Did I say it right? Did I, did I do the right thing? And then you start, let me ask you, then I start saying, well, where is the sin? See, this is something Israel struggled with. They thought, well, we'll find the sin and God will respond. What they didn't realize is that God responds even despite sin. He's not looking for you to get it right. He's looking for a place to do right, to make right. Lord, well, that's, it's, an, it's a clear indicator when I'm trying to find out what I did wrong that I'm based in a performance and works-based faith. 
But the Holy Spirit got a hold of me in that moment. See, I was between pronouncement and fulfillment, and I had actually got halfway and thought I was already there and lost the dream. And God reminded me, it's not by your might, it's not by your power, but it's by the Spirit of God that I will bring about what I promise. My word will manifest, but not because of you. If God will use a donkey, if he'll use, he'll use a, a Persian king, he will certainly use any and everybody despite what their behavior is. When God decides to do something, he will do it. And I'm in the middle of that season and we, we begin to say, God, what is it you want us to do? And I don't know about you, but whenever I have a disappointment, I'm tempted not to go and do it again. I'm tempted not to take another step of faith out. First of all, for us to do that again, it was going to cost a whole lot more money. But more than the money, the money, let me tell you something, just so you, just a side note, money is nothing for God. Means are nothing for God. He, he can provide what it is he's going to provide for. It's really a farce we make up in our world. We, don't get caught up in that lie. Because time after time, and the, the, there's, there's several testimonies attached to that, but God provided it all, expense-free. God provided debt-free. That was a miracle, and that's for another day. But we got in the middle of that, and we said, God, what do you want us to do? And he said, first, I want you to know that what I said I'll do, I'll do it. And secondly, I want you to take a step of faith again. And it was a risk for us. We didn't want to be disappointed again. But I realized in that moment, I could not base my faith on my experience. I had to base my faith on the Word of God. I was in the middle of my dark season, so we stepped out again. And the story for us is that there was one fertilized egg left, and her name is Anna, and she lives today. She's seven years old. She's as sassy and as wild and as fighting as she ever thought we, you ever thought she could be. It, that she was the last. It was a miracle. After that, there, there wasn't. We didn't have any other uh, uh, fertilized eggs. We didn't have anything left. And we trusted God, and God saw it through to the end. And I realized in that moment that when God decides to do a miracle, he's going to do a miracle. The, what was swirling around me in those nine months, and, don't, and I don't want to polish it up. For nine months, we battled that spirit of fear that said, you're going to lose it again. You're going, to, you're going to fail again. I don't know. I just feel like that's for somebody. All 2018, you're going to fail again. You're going to do it again. It's not going to work this time. But I fought back that every day with this one thing. What God said he will do, he will do. He might, you're right, he might not do it this way, but he's going to do it his way. He might not come through like this, like I thought he would, but all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose and that are following his plan. Somebody shout all things. The problem is we're raised in a culture that sees success as the measure for faithfulness instead of obedience. You and I are being saturated daily by a culture that says, if I can look good and sound good and have the right story, then that must mean God's blessing me and I'm faithful. The problem is, is that Scripture says the opposite. It says, if I'm dying and as long as I'm obedient, then I am following the ways of Jesus. Our, we, we spend our days trying to make sure that we get enough likes and we retweets and write posts and make sure it looks good. I was at Christmas and I had, my niece was there. She's in college and one of her girlfriends showed up and I'm, they're across the room and they're hanging out and having a fun time. They're, they're kind of rec they're, they're getting together again, telling stories. They hadn't seen each other in a while. And they, they, the other girl had to leave and they're about to break, break apart. And she says, I heard her say, so let's take a selfie. Okay, okay. Those girls took eight selfies in eight different poses. One with the lips out, you know, you know, one, one just, just hugging. And, and I mean, how many ways does it take to get a... I can tell you this, what's impossible is to get two ladies to agree that the picture works for both of them. I know that from experience. Nobody, they're not going to both agree that the, the, that's the right picture. So they're taking, and I realize what they're doing. What they're doing is they want to get the perfect image. They're not going to show the first one they took. They're going to keep taking it until it looks just right so they can show the world, this is how we look, this is how my, my chin looks, this is how my face looks, my makeup's just right. When the reality is, two seconds later it was all messed up and the double chin was showing and whatever. Come on, somebody help me. 
You, can somebody, somebody be real? We're, we're, trying to, we're trying to post a, an image that is our image that seems like the world would want instead of posting the image of God which comes in faithfulness and, and obedience and following God and saying yes to His command and being humble and having character. Those are things you're not going to find on a Facebook post. I got nothing, I have nothing against social media. It's just you can't digitize the obedience of God. You can't digitize and, tech, and use technology to talk about the image of God and make it real for somebody. It's that God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and true living God. It won't happen on Twitter. It'll happen in a face-to-face -to -face touch by somebody who's been through the dark season. St. John of the Cross wrote a book that's in many impact on my life. It's called The Dark Night of the Soul. His quote will show you on the screen. He said that many will praise and bless Jesus as long as they receive some consolation from him. But if he hides himself and he leaves them for a little while, they fall either into complaining or into excessive dejection. It's amen or oh me, it's probably both. We are happy with God as long as he's doing the way we want him to do. But the moment, and can I say something to you? We, it, it's all metaphor in many ways. We're trying to understand God that, that is beyond us, that's otherworldly. And yes, God is always with us. But yes, sometimes he will leave you. He will separate from you in the dark place and have you fumble around. And in that moment, the question is, what happened to my praise? See, we will, St. John of the Cross says we will bless and we will praise God as long as he promises some type of consolation. See, God is different from Santa Claus, by the way. You don't sit on God's lap, tell him what you want, and pull the lever. Because God's more than, more, he wants more for you than to get you what you think you want. He wants to make you into what he's called you to be. He's trying to make you into the man or the woman that you were born for. And so you might ask for one thing, and he just like I tell my daughter when she's saying, give me a Snickers for dinner. I say, no, honey, we're not doing that. And she might stomp her feet, and she might throw out on the floor. But I say, I love you more than I could give you that, that candy, and it would, it would hurt you. It would not help you. It would not make you into what you're supposed to be. We can't just serve God when it's convenient. We can't just serve God when we feel successful. We can't just take social media posts when we get it just right. It's time for the church to be real. And start saying, this is the God we serve. He's the God of the pronouncement. He's the God of fulfillment. But he's also the God in the darkness of the night. He's the God of the process. Let me say this, you can respond to God in three ways. You could, you, when God's testing you in your season, you can respond with avoidance. You can avoid the whole thing. I can't tell you how many of us, and you know this, if, you're, if you'd be true to yourself, you'd say, how many times have we avoided the process only to find us at the same place a year later? When God invite, invites you into a test, you can try to go around it, but you're going to be just like Israel. You're going to be at the same side of the mountain one year later. You're going to take a seven or eight day journey and make it a 40 year process. And it's amazing how often we find someone to blame. We call that the scapegoat method. We're always finding someone to attach our anger to or our disappointment to because it's easier to hang it on somebody else than to hold on to it and embrace it for the reality of where we are right now. When you'll, if you'll just stop avoiding it and you'll say, this is where I am, God will say, I know, but I'm not leaving you there. You can't go 10 steps until you admit where you are right now. You can respond to testing with abandonment. 
It's excessive dejection. You can, you can respond believing that God has abandoned you. But I want to tell you that, that for many of us, our struggle with trying to move from where we are to where God has called us to be is that we have a trust issue with the Lord. We think he left us. If, and, I, and, I, and one of the major breakthroughs some people have in their life is if you'll just go back to that time when you were 15 years old and realize God was with you. He was suffering with you. He is the suffering servant. He is hurting with you. You are not alone. He has not left you. You are in a dark place, but God is there with you. You have not been abandoned. Somebody needs to get that in your spirit today. You have not been left alone to suffer this process. I can tell you this, that he is, that your wounds wound him too. And that's an encouraging thought this morning. You can respond in avoidance, obedience, or you can respond with allegiance. You can just make this declaration, I believe God. And I trust in Him. I believe what He has to say. We, we just went through Christmas and we celebrated Mary. And Pastor Jay mentioned that this morning. As Mary in Luke 138, she gets this, this unbelievable word from God that she will have a child. He will be the Messiah. And she will have that child outside of, 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 of marriage and outside of, of, of a sexual relationship. And she says, how is this possible? But then she makes this statement in th- verse 38. I am your servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. What she was saying was, is that I know in all this other worldly lordship, this wouldn't be possible. But I'm removing myself from that Lord and I'm putting myself under this God, the God of the miraculous, and saying, Lord, let it be to me according to your word. i got to tell you today, the wrestling in your spirit is not over if this thing's going to happen or not. It's a matter of what God will you serve. The wrestling in your spirit is about who you are going to confess as Lord over your life. Because I can tell you today, your confession is leading you away from God or it's leading you toward God. So what is your confession? Who is your allegiance to? I mean, if you realize church attendance is not the same thing as allegiance to the Lord. Church attendance, you having the right dress or saying the right things is not the same thing as Jesus being Lord. I'll push your doctrine a little bit more. You just saying a prayer just because you said words doesn't make God your Lord. Lordship is about your confession. It's about it's not about your performance because I guarantee you most of us will fall short before the day is out. What it is about is me saying, Lord, I'm not perfect. I'm not even holy. But by you and by your grace, I have been made new. I'm a new creation because I'm living in another kingdom. I reject the kingdom of this empire and I live according to the kingdom of your world. My confession is, is that you are Lord in my life. As we end this morning, I want to share with you these things. This is what I felt like God has for you to hear as you end 2018, move to the next year. How does God use this season of testing to fulfill his promise in my life? What what does God use this in-between moment of my life to get me to the promise? I truly believe that many of us are moving into 2019 in a whole nother level. A new level of breakthrough, a new level of release. I'm just convinced that God is not done ever. And so as he's taking us into this new season, I can't, as as what uh, Cece was saying earlier, is that I can't ignore what he's doing right now. I can't just pretend like this doesn't matter because it matters. I want what you're doing now, Lord, in this in-between season. The first thing that a season of testing does, a testing season grows us deeper so God can take us higher. It grows us deeper so that God can take us higher. We spend so much time trying to get the outward appearance right when we have to realize it's only in prayer. Listen, you might, you might be able to give a great testimony, but what I want to know is what's the testimony that God's working on right now that no one knows about? What's the work below the water? That God's working. Because I I don't want to be just a a tiny uh, uh, pin sticking out above the water with no real depth in my life. Because I'll be washed away with the next wave. What I want is I want whatever is above me to just be a fraction about what God has done beneath my life. The roots in my life. 
James 1, 4 says that the testing of our faith, we said before, it comes to perfect us so that we're lacking in nothing. And I want to say to you this morning that as you press into this next year, as you get back to your quiet place, you can't just make, you can't just live Sunday to Sunday, service to service, preach to preach. Some of us are so addicted to preaching and word and church that we have no root system in our life. I want to know where is God on Wednesday? Where is God Thursday morning when I've had all I can take of my coworkers? Because the truth is they had all they could take of me too. What I'm wondering is, what kind of man am I becoming right in the middle of that? How am I growing deeper so that God can grow higher through me? The testing of our faith grows us deeper. The second thing is, the testing season in your life reminds you that there is no power greater than resurrection power. There is no power. Everybody say, no power. No power greater than resurrection power. This is how God works. You can't know resurrection power without knowing the dying process. You can't know the life and resurrection of the Lord without knowing the cross and the grave. Many of us are trying to avoid our cross and grave season, but you are going to come short of resurrection power, and it will be not fulfilling for you. Luke 24, 26 says it was was necessary. This is what Jesus is saying. It was necessary that the Christ, that's important there, it's necessary that the Christ should suffer so that he could enter into his glory. I want you and I to enter into what God has, not so that I can be glorified, so that he can be glorified. But in order for that to be possible, I have to walk the process of death so that I can experience resurrection power. In my own life, I trust that this is the way God leads me. He, he leads me in the path of righteousness. He does lead me beside still waters, but he will also lead me through the path of death to pick up my cross. And I have to know that even when I'm in my season of difficulty and trial, that the prayer, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, still applies to that moment. That whatever God has provided for me is radically enough. See, here's a struggle that we have. We won't walk into the path of death because we have a, a trust issue. And we don't believe that God is radically enough because we keep bleeding into our margins day after day. We keep wanting for more. Instead of saying, Lord, what you've given me, I'm going to take of it. I'm going to live in that grace. Can I say something? If you're in a place of anxiety and fear, that's a clear indication that you're outside of your grace. Now, there's a difference between the words of the enemy that is trying to lie towards you. But if if, if we're in a place of fear and anxiety, we have to realize, God, whatever you provided for me is enough. I'm going to live this way. I'm going to function this way. And then, listen, there's not just enough for me. There's enough for somebody else. That resurrection power, that dying process, it makes me alive in such a way that I can be at peace and at rest in whatever season I am and I can give to someone else and say, God has made me an avenue. See, that's what Jesus is doing. The resurrection of Christ makes him an avenue so that life could come. And I want to tell you, on the other side of you giving up what you're holding on to, God is making you life for somebody else. That's what Paul was saying. The death in me is being life in you. We need more people that are willing to go through that process. And the third thing is the testing season in that time, we lose what we must to gain what God has. We lose what we must to gain what God has. I wonder what it is this past year that God has been trying to get you to let go of. What part of you and the way you've done things and the way you think and the way your life has been made up, what is God saying, I want you to let go of that in order for me to give you something new? 
This process that God takes us through will challenge you and challenge your faith. But I want to encourage you, whatever it is you're letting go, it pales in comparison to what He has for you. Whatever it is the Lord has for you, whatever it is He's offering you, don't believe the enemy's lie of scarcity that says if you give that thing up, if you stop protecting it, if you don't keep people away, you'll be left with nothing. That's a lie of the enemy. For God is a God of abundance. And what He's pouring into your life is greater, it's bigger, it's more fulfilling than anything you could have imagined. You just got to let go what's in this hand so that you can grab a hold and get your arm. Let me tell you something. You'll let go of that teeny thing, that small thing in your hand. And to get get your thing, you have to get your arms around what God's given you. Because he gives handfuls and handfuls. We serve an abundant God. Don't live with a scarcity mentality because it will keep you from fulfillment. Reject that lie that says, if I let go of what I have, I'll never get what God has for me. And as the band comes, I want to share this final thing, this final testing. And I shared this in the first service. I love Miss Betty. If you've not ever met Miss Betty, she's right over here on the front row every week. And this past year, we've been praying together for a miracle. What we realized was we prayed, not just us, but the whole team, Bishop and Pastor Kathy, all of us have been praying What we realize is that the testing season in my life really is a test of my confession. God's not testing the dream. The dream is sure. What he wants to know is what is your confession. And I remember we've been praying since the beginning of the year with Miss Betty. She had an eye degeneration issue. and, And with week by week and just seemed like month after month it just got worse. And it was hard to... It was hard in those moments. We, we were, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm believing God, I want God to answer right away. Give me the miracle. Because I believe that the miracle is a sign that God exists. When the reality is that my confession aligns with God's existence. My confession is attuning myself to allegiance with God. And so we began to, to pray with Miss Betty. And we said, God, would you do a miracle? Month after month, it just got worse. For too long, she couldn't get around, and when she would, she would be, she couldn't see at night, and and she couldn't make it out to events. And she called me one day, and we, I know she shared this with others. She texted me. She said, "I, I realize what God's been doing. What He wants to know is what is my confession right now, even when I don't have my promise." What God's really trying to do is He wants to know if I don't ever get a new eye, if I don't ever see like I really want to see, is He still God on the throne? And she said, I just began to confess all over my house, my God is the God of miracles. My God is a God of faithfulness. My God is a God of healing. My God is a God of restoration. My God is a God of wholeness. My God is a God of joy. My God is a God of deliverance. My God is a God of salvation. See, I don't know where you're at today, but if you begin to declare all the goodness of the Lord, then He begins to release new wind and new breath and new wholeness into your dream again. And it wasn't long right before, before long, we, we started praying, and she said, you know what? I began to confess, and this week and this month, I can see a little bit better. I went to the doctor, and they said the degeneration has stopped, and all of a sudden it's starting to be healed. I'm starting to be whole again. I'm starting to be complete again. Can I tell you this? The greater miracle in her life is not the healing of an eye. That is nothing for God. It's the restoration of her confession of faith. That says God is God no matter what the circumstance. I want to know are there people in the church today that can stand to their feet and say my confession is this. My God is greater than my circumstance. My God is greater than my attack. My God is greater than my disappointment. My God is greater than my experience. Why don't you lift your hands right where you're at. God, I'm thankful for today that our confession is right and true. That you're amazing, wonderful, miraculous healer. And we declare today that you're at work even when we don't see it. You're at work even when I don't see it. I'm in the middle of this dark room fumbling around. I look like an idiot. I feel like an idiot. I'm I'm discombobulated, confused, disoriented. I don't have nothing together. I'm a hot mess right now, but I'm in your hands. 
Some of us just need to confess it now. God, you're at work. You're a miracle worker. You're a promise keeper. You're the son of the living God. And my allegiance is to you alone. I don't want my way. I don't want the Santa Claus way. I don't want the get it my way. I want Jesus' way. And I'm worshiping now. I just want you to lift your hands and worship with us. We're going to end today. This team's going to lead us. You're at work, Lord. When I don't see you. Come on. Some of us need to declare that. Believe that. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. This is a moment for somebody. Right now, he's working. Right in your in between season, he's working. Come on, sing. Even when I don't see you work. You're at work right now. Come on, the Holy Spirit is hovering. He is brooding over us today. Somebody's dream is coming back to life. Somebody's joy is coming back to life. Make that your confession. You never stop working. You never stop working. Come on, you're the way maker. You are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Come on, make that the declaration. Make that your confession. That is who you are. God is a way maker. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness. My God is who you are. One more time. You're the way maker. Yeah. Way maker. Miracle worker. Promise keeper. I don't know if you're joining us online or if you're in the building. I just want you right now to see this moment as a breakthrough moment for you. He's a miracle worker. He's a way maker. He's the God of the resurrection, and he's God in the night. You might be in the in-between season, but I want to challenge you. God's not done with 2018. I'm telling you, there's still a couple more days left. Somebody's going to get an uncommon miracle in even the next couple days because God's setting you up for a great, great breakthrough new season in 2019. I bless your people today, God, as their hands are lifted. Lord, as they declare your goodness, as they declare by faith what you're doing, I agree with them that you are not done in their life and that what is to come is greater than what's behind us because, Lord, you're a God that always outdoes himself. We celebrate what you've done. We acknowledge even when it seemed like things were lost. Lord, you were at work. You've been making, it's a setup. And I'm thankful for the setup even when it doesn't feel or I, or it feels like I'm confused and there's darkness around, but God, I bless them right now that as they enter into this next season, there would be a confession of faith on their lips, knowing the God we serve is God of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You're God of the day before the death. You're the God at Calvary, and you're the God on resurrection morning. You are the one and true and living God. I pray that blessing over them right now. Lord, lead us as a church into a new season. And we commit, Lord, to follow you 
into that direction, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing. We bless, Lord, this church. As we end 2018, let this be, Lord, a time where we celebrate ending and celebrate beginning the new. In Jesus' name. Come on, can you shout amen? Put your hands together and thank God for his word. Thank God for each other. Why don't you love on somebody? Shake a hand or two before you go. We'll see you in the new year. Next Sunday is Bishop B.